Let's start with a question that I didn't get to ask during this interview, which is, is our relationship with our technology and looking at a screen all the time responsible, at least in part, for our disassociation with the effects of climate change? Whenever I conduct an interview, I write out 20 to 30 questions that I keep in front of me as a guideline. But if you've listened to this podcast and some of my interviews, I like to keep it a little more conversational. So I never know where they're really going to go. I have my guide there and then I go from that. But in this conversation, I'm talking with Maura O'Connor, the author of Wayfinding, the science and mystery of how humans navigate the world. Now, for context, about two months ago, I read an article in the Washington Post that was an excerpt of her book about how GPS is affecting our cognition. This is something that's very important to me. So I followed up writing an article for Big Think on the topic using her article as a springboard of sorts to talk from. And I tagged her on Twitter. And then she reached out to me with one particular issue she had with my coverage of it. It turns out she told me that something like, the effects of cognition were less than 10% of the book, and I was very interested. So I made the change in the article and then bought the book and asked her if she wanted to have a talk, which she said once she was done traveling, she would love to. So you were about to hear that conversation. First of all, let me just say, and you'll hear it in the very beginning of our talk, this is just a really well-written book. Even if you had no interest at all in wayfinding or navigation, it's just a book that is lovely to read. And that's really, really, as a writer and as a reader, I really appreciate that. But this is a topic we should all care about. We are, as animals, inextricably bound to our environment. And the less attention we have to pay to the environment, the worse it's doing to our biology, to our cognition, to our thinking patterns. When we walk around all the time distracted because we're looking at something in our hand, then we don't form a relationship to our environment every, anymore. As you'll hear later in the talk, Maura talks about how she doesn't like to speculate, but I do like to speculate. And this comes from over 15 years of teaching movement and over 25 years as a practitioner and as a lifetime playing sports and someone whose entire life has been based on exercise, fitness, sports, whatever it is. But the relationship I have with a team that I'm on or a competitor that I'm playing against or even just myself in trying to make gains in the gym or become more flexible. But all of that ties into how I move about the world. And when you lose that relationship, you lose a vital part of yourself because we're not these individualized beings floating around freely on a rock. We are part of the process of organic life on this planet. And I think it's really dangerous all of the ways in which we shield ourselves from that. Specifically, we'll be talking a bit about GPS and driverless cars towards the end in this conversation. I could ramble on for hours about this topic, so I'll shut up now, but I would just like to thank you for listening to the Earthrise podcast. As always, you can contact me via any of the social media channels that are linked from DerekBarris.com. I also invite you to check out M.R. O'Connor, O-C-N-N-O-R dot info, which is Maura's website where you can find more of her articles as well as her first book and wayfinding as well. I am going to pick up her first book, which is about resurrection science. I talked with Britt Ray a few years ago on this podcast about the same topic, which is fascinating. But for now, let's turn to Maura and how we navigate our world. First of all, congratulations, because like I said, I read a lot and I read a lot of books for information, but I also really appreciate when books are well written, which is something that's just slightly harder to find, especially in an age where it's more about content than writing at this point. And I really appreciate your book because it's so well written. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. I want to start big picture, and then there's a lot of more detailed questions I want to get into. But I just, at a very basic level, what was the inspiration of this book? I think that I had not thought much about navigation before starting this book. And a lot of writers tend to, I think, overestimate the importance of their subject matter 
but I can genuinely say that navigation is this strange phenomena in the sense that it is something that every single one of us is engaged in every single day of our lives, but it is not something that many of us give much thought to or step back and and think about. And so for me, the moment that I, my attention was sort of drawn to navigation in my own life was after having used a smartphone with a GPS device in it for it's like almost eight years, I think. I was using it in a very rural part of New Mexico and it basically led me astray. I was trying to find a hot spring and I put the location into my phone and the GPS directed me to drive to like the banks of the Rio Grande River and this basically a cliff. You know, there's a funny scene in the office where uh, Michael is following his GPS directions into a lake and <laughs> Dwight is saying, stop. And he's saying, no, I can't, I can't. And, you know, that's like a very satirical treatment of something that literally happened to me, you know, <laughs> in a sense. And I was just like, wow, why do I have such unquestioned faith in my GPS to tell me where to go, even in a place where I I would have been much better off talking to someone who actually had direct experience or even generational knowledge uh, of this very rural place in the Southwest. So I had that experience and then started thinking more broadly about how it is that gadgets kind of infiltrate themselves into our lives in ways that we don't necessarily question. But in this case, what does it mean to outsource a cognitive skill to a gadget and what what are the implications and effects of that? And then the book really grew out of that question. That is a question that I think about often and I want, I want to get to, but like the narrative of your book, I want to start further back in terms of how we navigate in general. And you say in the book, you write, getting lost is a uniquely human problem. I think if you consider how many animals and species of animals in the world depend on precise navigation to survive. You know, you see how this is a phenomenon that is really critical to to evolution. If there were species that were prone to becoming lost, they wouldn't survive. And humans, on the other hand, do seem to have this ability, which is kind of confounding. And it seems to me that the reason for that is we really don't have the same kind of biological hardware that a lot of other species have that can tell us almost instinctively or intuitively where we are at all times, orient us in space, or even say, for instance, like genetic programming that might tell us now is the time to migrate and help us get where we want to go. And really animal navigation, there are countless mysteries about how different species do what they do. But compared to humans, there's just no real doubt that we are pretty miserable navigators compared to even a butterfly or a a lowly aphid, let alone leatherback turtles or bar-tailed godwits that travel 6,000 miles over an open ocean, you know, to get uh, from one habitat to another. There's some really interesting studies at the Max Planck Institute where they would put people in blindfolds and then tell them to walk in a straight line. And what they found is that people actually start walking in circles that measure roughly 66 feet in diameter pretty quickly. And so, but they'll tell you that they that they are walking in a straight line. So that's just like a great illustration of, of how bad humans kind of are at this. But what we've done is we've created cultural traditions and um, ways of transmitting and teaching skill from one generation to the next. And we sort of used culture to make up for the deficit of biological mechanisms that other species seem to have. We use the group. I mean, in terms of evolutionary biology, we're weak, we're slow, 
uh, we're not the most intelligent as adaptable to our environment, but we do have advantages like being bipedal, which helps with communication skills. Right. I really appreciated the dive into maps that you talk and talking about maps as metaphors for the cultures that create them. You probably didn't include this in your book because your book came out about the same time, but Barbara Tversky wrote a book called Mind in Motion, and she spends many chapters talking about map making, how it requires a sense of almost a godlike ability of, of being above and looking down to be able to understand and orient yourself. Mm-hmm. I would like you to explore a little about the cultural aspect because it made me think of the very common world map that here in America we grew up with, America seems as large as Africa, even though we can basically fit inside the Congo. How did you find that being in the Arctic and then in Australia, what does the type of map that someone creates tell them about the culture? Right. Well, I think what I realized pretty quickly during my research for the book and talking to different anthropologists and going to some of the places that you mentioned was that maps to my surprise, are not universal. So I think in largely Western cultures, we have an idea that maps are the way to find your way, whether that's a physical paper map in your hands or a cognitive map in the brain. So that's a term that is used very frequently in in neuroscience to describe how it is that we create mental representations of space and then use those representations to figure out ways to get from A to B. But there is actually extensive debate in anthropology and neuroscience and psychology over whether or not maps are culturally universal. And what I found was that, based on my own readings, they're not. And so that raises this really interesting question, like how could we possibly find our way without a map? I think that that instrument is so central to our, anybody who's grown up, say, in an urban environment or in Western culture, it's almost inconceivable to think of other strategies for navigation. But actually, there's this astonishing range of human navigation systems that use observation, memory, perception, environmental cues, different types of language to describe space, and some that may not use that sort of godlike bird's eye view of space, but actually use a different type of strategy. Um, sometimes it's called like route finding, where you don't use the bird's eye view, but you use that here is the tree and after the tree, there will be a mountain and after the mountain, there will be a lake. So you're really actually navigating from the perspective of the individual on the ground moving through space. So I think that was one of the most satisfying kind of revelations that I discovered through writing the book because it just really deepens the mystery and the diversity around human culture and just really opened up other possibilities of human experience in the world that hadn't necessarily occurred to me. And as a journalist and a writer and, a, and, and someone who focuses on science, that's the most kind of tantalizing, uh, exciting discovery I could make. I spent about a decade of my life working in world music journalism. So I was fortunate to get to travel to a lot of places to cover festivals and artists, which I really, as a journalist as well, I enjoy doing. But I I have to say, we talked before I started recording this about uh, leaving Brooklyn for the cold. The fact that you went to the Arctic for this book, that, that really shows a dedication <laughs> that it, that is tremendous. And you write about Inuit culture and their transition from dog sledding to snowmobiles. Now, our brains have this very unique paradox in that we are attracted to novelty and new situations, but at the same time, we will default to the easiest possible way if it's going to conserve energy. So we want speed and efficiency. But what did you find that Inuits you talked to or anyone in the course of your book, when they transition in that way, what do they feel they have lost? Yeah, I think I went to the Arctic and I went to Nunavut, which is a, a sovereign part of the Canadian Arctic. And I went up there kind of expecting to 
just show up and say like who who which hunters can take me out on their dog sleds um so that I could talk with them and and hopefully learn something about the ways in which they navigate in order to hunt and what I discovered was this was kind of like showing up in New York City in the 21st century and being like hey who can take me on a ride on a horse and carriage <laughs> oh why aren't there horse and carriages around here and it was really quickly explained to me the Inuit and particularly Inuit hunters are not very romantic. And if there is a practical advantage of using, say, a rifle over a harpoon, then that is a choice they will make because the necessities of of hunting in the Arctic are so challenging and extreme. And what I found was that a lot of hunters, even those who are using traditional navigation skills, you know, use snowmobiles. Um, That's definitely by far the most common way of, of traveling the landscape, especially in Iqaluit, which is the kind of city, I'll put city in quotes because it's pretty small, uh, to get around. That being said, you know, what some of the hunters told me is that the biggest difference between being on a dog sled and a snowmobile when you're trying to navigate is speed and how much you can actually attend to when you're traveling 60 miles an hour versus 15 miles an hour. And one of the things about traditional Inuit navigation that's so fascinating is it really relies on this attention to detail because the landmarks in the, in the Arctic are so different from what anyone from the South would consider a landmark. So, you know, here in Manhattan, I might use the Empire State Building as a landmark to know where I am and to orient in space. Well, in the Arctic, it could be that a hunter who's in an extremely flat landscape covered in in snow will use a boulder as a landmark. And it could be that they'll even use the pattern of moss that's growing on a rock to distinguish it from other rocks in the landscape and use that as a landmark. And you can imagine that if you're traveling at 60 miles an hour, what you're able to attend to and the detail that you're able to sort of put in your memory, so to speak, would really change. And it also just extends the reach, you know, how far they can go. And so that also has changed where and and how they get places. But what I also saw was a tremendous effort on the part of community leaders and hunters in those communities to preserve these skills and also pass them down to the next generation because it's not just about hunting, it's navigation is extremely crucial to sort of Inuit identity and culture itself. So it ties into language, it ties into oral storytelling, it ties into their relationship and stewardship of the land itself. And you also write that narration may have begun in hunting society. Specifically, I think we were in Australia at this point, you were talking about a tracker imagines being in the mind and body of the author of the trackway and then creates a narrative. I'd love for you to explain a little bit about this. Almost, you know, one of the defining characteristics of humans in evolutionary biology is empathy and our ability to imagine ourselves as other people and animals. What are some instances of that that you experienced while writing this book? Yeah, I think this link between navigation and storytelling was also something that was unexpected to me. We are the only species that seems to have so thoroughly used memory to assist us in the task of navigation. And we know that what's called episodic memory, which is our ability to recall events that happened in the past, is based in this part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is the same exact area of the brain where navigation and spatial orientation takes place. And interestingly, the hippocampus is also this part in the brain that allows us to imagine ourselves in the future. And so it seems that the hippocampus is intrinsic to this ability to develop narratives and stories about where we were in the past, how we came to be where we are now, and where we are going in the future. And so this is, I think, really interesting that navigation may have helped us to develop this narrative capacity. And then different cultures have used this narrative capacity as a sort of mnemonic device. And what I mean by that is they've used stories themselves as devices to 
encapsulate topographic information. And the best example of that is, as you mentioned, in, I think, Australia, where Aboriginal Australians have this tens and tens of thousand year um, history of using song lines. And what those are, are essentially stories about how Aboriginal Australians ancestors created the topography of the landscape through their travels in a time called the dream time. And the journeys of those ancestors are recorded in songs and stories that people learn and memorize. So a chunk of the book is sort of dedicated to the idea that song lines are not just repositories for incredible environmental, ecological knowledge, Aboriginal law and history, but that they're also navigation aids and that in these journeys are actually routes that people could literally follow through the landscape to get from one place to the other. And I was really fortunate to go to a few different parts of Australia and talk to people who are sort of leaders and elders in their communities and, and, and still uh, know many of these, of these stories and songs. You also write about defining a relationship between music and navigation. And again, as a music journalism journalist, I really appreciated that. And I wonder if you could explore that a little bit more. Yeah, well, I had this um, conversation with a neuroscientist at Boston University, um, Howard Eichenbaum, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years. So he had dedicated his career to studying the hippocampus. And he had very interesting ideas about whether or not the hippocampus is actually mapping space. And his one of his theories was that the hippocampus is kind of a grand organizer of the brain and of human experience, and that it's not just mapping uh, space, but it's also mapping other dimensions of human experience, including time, social relationships. And he and a few other psychologists have sort of likened the process of, of navigating to a kind of unfolding of a melody or a musical sequence. And I think that is a beautiful concept. And so I've, I spent some time in the book talking about Howard Eichenbaum's ideas and also this possibility that, you know, what it is that we're doing when we, when our brains are interacting and, and mapping the world is is much richer and complicated than just a kind of measuring and calculation of distance and computing a route from A to B, but that it could also be implicated in all these other facets of our experience. I'm fascinated by neuroscience. I actually have a tattoo of a seahorse on my forearm from the hippocampi. Oh, wow. Because, because memory is my favorite aspect of neuroscience to study. Yeah. And I, I was introduced to neuroscience science from Dan Levinson's book, This Is Your Brain on Music, which just blew my mind open. I think that was 2005. And he talks about that nothing that we experience as humans lights up as many parts of your brain as music. It's a system-wide effect where nothing else really has that sort of effect on us. Going to memory, you write that, uh, I believe, again, it might have, it was in Australia where you said that they don't see memory as abstract traces in the mind, but as a socially guided rhythm of body movement and gesture that is integral part of transmission. What is the importance of our relationship to our environment? And what do you think is being lost when we're using devices like GPS? I think that for me, the person who best articulated this idea is the psychologist James Gibson, who is kind of one of the first examples I could find of someone using the term wayfinding, you know, which is the title of the book. And Gibson was working in the 1920s and 30s. Um, he passed away in the 1970s, and his ideas were kind of radical. He was a psychologist who would study how people drive or pilots that fly airplanes. And he kind of came to the conclusion that this whole idea of Cartesian dualism, that we're not actually interacting directly with the world around us because the brain is sort of this mechanistic process that's creating images of the world 
for us and we're never in direct contact, so to speak, with the world outside of our heads. He's sort of felt that this wasn't really satisfying and, and he created all of these tests to test the idea of what uh, a theory he called ecological um, psychology. And so his idea was that we are really the brain is just part of a sort of complete visual system. And that natural vision involves, you know, eyes in our heads connected to a body, which is walking on the ground. And that unencumbered exploration is really about us looking at things from all perspectives, moving forward, and this what he called transitions between vistas. And so he actually I don't think it was his main objective, but he kind of created this alternative theory for navigation, which is that navigation really depends on us directing our attention and directly perceiving the environment. I think this idea is really gaining a lot of traction um, that, you know, we're not kind of consciousness floating in bodies, but we are embodied organisms that are connected to our environment. And to me, that really created a much richer idea of of what it is that we're doing when we're navigating. And I won't argue that GPS is not an incredibly powerful tool that has many positive benefits for us to use. But I think there's no debate that it really changes the way we direct our attention. And I, I think I write in the book, it kind of seduces our attention downward. Whereas what Gibson was talking about is really this very powerful directing of attention, giving attention to the environment and paying attention to what we see um, as we move through the environment. And so I think those two things are just really different practices. And uh, perhaps we can argue the benefits of, of one over the other in different contexts, but I do think that using a gadget uh, really changes that process a great deal. You cite a, 2000, a 2008 study about people walking while using GPS as compared to experience or paper maps, and you walk, to they, they walk more slowly and made greater direction errors as well as it, it was tougher for them to find their way. And I, I see this all the time. I personally believe, and we don't have any long-term evidence of this yet, but I do think I'm 44 in my generation and, and earlier, especially, we're going to see a massive uptick in degenerative diseases. Yeah, I think this is a pretty nascent field of study, but there's sort of studies coming out of different areas of cognitive disease studies, aging, memory, and then navigation as well, pointing at you know, these really uh, interesting relationships between spatial orientation strategies, the hippocampus, and cognitive disease. And what they're showing is not a direct relationship between, say, using a device to uh, find your way and specifically like turn-by-turn directions that are saying, okay, now go left, now go right, and diseases in the brain. But what they're showing is that our attention really changes when we use those devices. So an even more recent study was a couple of years ago where they looked at people navigating a neighborhood in uh, Soho, London, and those who used paper maps and GPS showed really different big differences in activity in the hippocampus. And basically, the hippocampus kind of loses interest in new information and new streets when it's being told to take a a left or a right. And that kind of makes intuitive sense. If we're being told what to do, we don't necessarily have to pay attention for ourselves. The stakes are are much lower. But interestingly, at the same time that we're finding out about how the hippocampus changes as we're using different technologies, there's lots of information about diseases like Alzheimer's or dementia, PTSD, or even depression that shows that atrophy in the hippocampus is in many cases universal among those afflictions, particularly Alzheimer's disease. And the relationship is so direct that there's actually a video game called Sea Hero Quest, which is a navigation task um, in which people have to Um, use dead reckoning to find their way that is now 
being tested as a diagnostic tool for Alzheimer's disease. So you see this relationship, you know, what we don't know is what repeated use of like a GPS device over uh, weeks, months, or years would have on the volume of our hippocampus. But I think what we do know and can safely say is that the hippocampus, uh, its volume is dependent on experience. We can increase the volume of our hippocampus by employing spatial strategies to get from A to B. And we see that in studies about, say, um, London taxi drivers, where people whose daily jobs are dependent on the ability to find their way and use spatial strategies show greater volume in the hippocampus. And so if we're concerned about cognitive health and and memory, you know, we can't really do any harm by putting down (laughs) our devices and saying, you know what, I'm going to use a cognitive map or I'm going to create a new cognitive map to get where I want to go instead. Or get lost. Right. Just just willingly get lost. It's the first thing I do when I go to a foreign city is I just walk. Yeah. And then I have I have my phone if I need it. Yeah. But I just start walking. Yeah. I think that's a brilliant way to to experience a new place. And, you know, I think I always want to be cautious, like, well, don't you know, go to an unknown state forest and just like get lost. I mean, you know, there's and I think if you like went to the Arctic and, you know, people would think you're crazy, you know, to intentionally get lost. But like there are sort of we could say roughly known places in which we can freely explore and not be worried about wasting time or you know, becoming disoriented, like say even a museum or a park or, you know, there's different places where you can go and really, yeah, I think experience space in a much less constricted or anxious or feel for way. I think GPS, one of the downsides of it is that I've found that the more I rely on it, the more I rely on it. It's sort of like once you use it as a crutch, you're sort of less confident the next time you need to get somewhere or even the same place. It kind of is a a bit of a vicious circle. And so certainly trying to increase our own sense of confidence in our problem solving abilities and our own ability to to find our own way, you know, sort of forge our own path is a really uh, empowering and perhaps cognitively healthy thing to do. I have a good friend I've worked with for a long time, and we used to have to go to an investor meeting for a a previous project. And it was literally two roads, Venice Boulevard to another road that the office was on. And every week when he picked me up, he'd put GPS on. Yeah. And at the second week, by the second week, I said, we, it's just that one turn. And then there's the building. He's like, oh, well, I I can't remember. Right, right, right. And that's, that's, that's frightening. (laughs) Yeah, I think it's become such a relied upon tool in our day-to-day lives. And I I sort of see, you know, a lot of questioning of the role of technology in our lives these days. You know, even over the last year, I feel that there's sort of been a slew of journalistic articles of people who willingly gave up Amazon or switched to a flip phone instead of a smartphone. And GPS is one of these things where, because it is so powerful and easy to adapt into our day-to-day lives, there hasn't been as much questioning of its potential side effects but but yeah i mean gps only lasts as long as a battery lasts and it's you know perfectly fine in some contexts but in other contexts a total reliance on gps is pretty disastrous and you know there's plenty of examples out there of just really horrendous stupid and even sometimes fatal cases of people having absolute faith in a GPS to just treacherous ends. And that's pretty sad. In The Organized Mind, another book by Dan Levinson, he writes about what happens when you learn when you're multitasking, which is the information goes into your striatum instead of your hippocampus, and it creates higher levels of anxiety of cortisol, which is, of course, related to anxiety. So you're going to learn less well but you're also when you you know if you're in fight or flight mode and you're anxious the learning tends to imprint negatively i mean it, it's there for threat detection but it's also you, you you sort of create a threat out of things that aren't threatening 
And you write about, with navigation, the difference between the learning affecting your hippocampus and your caudate nucleus. Yeah, the caudate nucleus is this other sort of circuit in the brain that's responsible for a different type of spatial navigation strategy. And it's basically habit. It's a strategy that allows us to get to a place that maybe we get to every single day, say, the subway station you know, near my apartment building in Brooklyn. And, you know, I don't need to stop and create a spatial strategy for getting to that subway station. I just know when I leave my apartment building door, I take a right, then I take a left, and there's the subway station. And during that time, I'm thinking about other things. So it has this arguably evolutionary purpose, which is that it frees up our mind to think and focus on other things. We're not taking up that mental space creating a navigation strategy every time, you know, we're going to and from the subway. But what's interesting is that neuroscientists have found we're either using that caudate nucleus circuit or the hippocampal circuit to get from one place to the other. And the more we use one, the less we're using the other. So it really is this idea of the brain as a muscle. And the more you work out certain muscles, the bigger and more strong they become. And that's exactly the case with the hippocampus over the caudate nucleus. And what they've also found is that as we age, we rely on a spatial strategy based in the hippocampus less and less. And that kind of makes sense if we think about this idea that when you're young, you're exploring, you're moving a lot more even. And as we age, we're probably relying on habit a lot more. But when you consider how important the hippocampus is for the vigor of our memory, then you can see how by over relying on this sort of habitual strategy, we could really be experiencing other side effects in terms of early onset aging in the brain and perhaps even other cognitive ailments. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating kind of relationship. And some of the neuroscientists I talked to seemed quite alarmed by the possibility that we are over-relying on habit to get from one place to the other rather than vigorously exercising our hippocampus to get around. Hmm. Or vigorously exercising our bodies. I had mentioned I, I teach a variety of fitness modalities at Equinox. And it, I, I teach a variety because it's been well documented that moving your body in different ways constantly is the best thing you can do for your brain. Any exercise is better than none, but I find that a lot of people just run or just do yoga or just do something and they don't try other things. And I think this is in relationship to navigation in the sense that they have one relationship to their environment and then that's their default. And then when you ask them to move a different way, it really challenges them. And that challenge is really important. And I would argue it's the same for navigation. I used to, I started this in New York about 10 years ago, and I don't walk around LA as much because it's not as great a walking city. But when I see someone staring at their phone walking towards me, I just stop. Yeah. I just stop where I am and see what happens. And I've had a number of people walk into me and then yell at me for not moving out of their way. Right. From a social perspective, this understand, especially in a city like New York, where space is such limited real estate as it is, I wonder what this technology is doing to our ability to communicate effectively to one another. I hadn't quite thought of it that way. I mean, I think I see GPS as a part of a greater relationship to, you know, technology in our lives. And I think that has been well documented that we can certainly say that is changing, you know, our relationships. And I think you could easily find people on both sides of the argument that uh, there are positives and then there are negatives. I mean, I, what I started to think about towards the end of writing this book is the idea of the hippocampus being the locus of not just this episodic memory, but also future imagining and how navigation requires us to sort of develop this skill of empirical observation, of of being able to look around us and to say, observe phenomena and say, this is real and this is this is happening. And then how that really depends on a consensus with other people, how we build consensus about what is real and what is happening when we share those empirical observations, when we're all looking at the same thing together. And so to me, and I think 
you know, as a science journalist, I'm a little bit uncomfortable going out on such a long limb here, but couldn't that be the basis of building a consensus about the future as well, about what is happening now and also where we want to go in the future? And so I started really thinking about how technology and community today is really changing in the sense that we're not often all looking at the same thing together at the same time in the same spaces. Yeah, I guess that's all I can really say about that because I love to bring up philosophical questions as a science journalist, but then I I often feel somewhat inequipped to answer that <laughs> satisfyingly. So, but I but I, that did become a question for me, and it is in the book. I just don't know the answer to it right now. I, I appreciate your your respect for the facts. I mean, when I first emailed you after your uh, book was excerpted in the Washington Post, I had mentioned that you were very specific about trying to stick to the research, which I totally appreciate. I, I do speculate more, though. Uh, but one thing that is pretty apparent is that I believe that this what's happening with the technology is really dampening our critical thinking skills in the sense that I am critical of a number of facets of it in my columns. And then I get a lot of people responding to me saying basically, uh, you know, being a Luddite, which yeah. is a whole other story. But the, but I, my father started working as a computer programmer in the 60s. I grew up with them. I am a huge fan of them. But I, right. it's just like all of the people who say, if you're not an American, if you don't love America, leave it. It's like, no, you, you have to criticize the things you love. Right. Because if you don't, then then you they'll never get better. And your relationship to them can only change for the worse. Right. You know, I have also written since the book came out about autonomous vehicles and also received some pushback on some of the things that I was tackling. I like to think that I'm not a Luddite, but I do think that it was important for me to understand, for instance, how navigation evolved in the human species and how that may have been somewhat intrinsic to different aspects of our modern day civilization. Um, there's people who think that the ability to share information about topography was what helped bring about language itself, you know, and this idea of storytelling being connected to navigation. Well, storytelling is absolutely intrinsic to, you know, how we live in society and, you know, so many other aspects of our, of human culture. And so to me, it may be, you know, considered Ludditism to question the presence of these devices in our lives. But when we're talking about a skill that's been so intrinsic to our evolution and our identity as a species, then I think that's a point at which it becomes important to question what we're giving up for the sake of convenience and where we might push back a bit and say, well, actually, it's more important to me to really have these skills and to really actually kind of take joy in them. Because one thing I found is that the act of navigating and of paying attention to our surroundings and directing our, our attention is actually like pretty joyful and satisfying <laughs> as a person. And so that starts to be have more value than getting someplace in the shortest amount of time possible. And that's not to say that isn't important sometimes. And it isn't it great to have a tool that will do that for us? It's just that we seem to have adopted it so blindly that it's become problematic. I want to point out, too, that Luddites were not anti-technology. They were actually anti-losing their job. Right. <laughs> so, you know, that term uh, is, is important to recognize, but I understand how it's used in right. a modern sense. Yeah. But, I mean, you can argue that we're seeing the same thing happen with Amazon workers now and AI coming in. Right. Uh, but but you preempted what, what the last thing I wanted to bring up today was – the driverless car phenomenon. And I, I understand I am, I am an East coaster, like I said, and I am the person in Los Angeles who rolls down my window and tells people to get off their phone on the, on the road. Yeah. Because, because it's a social contract and I don't think people understand it. You're putting my life at, in danger by, by using your phone when you're driving. I don't mean GPS on the dashboard. I'm fine with that because we can mostly navigate. I mean, people who are just holding their phone and texting or whatever they're doing when they're driving. Yeah. And the argument against that is that, oh, you know, 420,000 people a year are injured or killed. Nine people a day are killed because of distracted driving. So right. the argument against it is that driverless cars will just fix that problem. Right. But obviously, and you write about this, that th there's more going on to that story. And I would 
love to hear why you think that driverless cars, what, what it will take away from us. What I've become interested in is how the technology of autonomous vehicles and the industry responsible for, for creating that technology, you know, has sort of picked the problems that they're saying it will solve. And we as a society have not thus far questioned whether there are other solutions to those problems that might actually be better than autonomous vehicles. And so, for instance, there's a brilliant journalist, Meredith Broussard, who has written about this. And, you know, she says, okay, if distracted driving is really responsible for these problems and we want to solve that problem, are driverless cars really the solution? Or could we just use technology that we already have, which is jamming people's phones when they get start driving their cars? Like, wouldn't that also solve this problem. Or I've written about the rally race car driver, Alex Roy, who's really questioned the whole safety argument of autonomous vehicles and provocatively asked, well, if safety is really our concern, what would the effect be of raising driver licensing standards? Like, could that also help the situation? Why is it that um, driverless cars are perceived as the answer to all of these different things. But from like a the sense of a of the individual, what I've wondered about and written about is how, you know, a driverless car will affect uh, how we get from one place to the other, how we navigate to get there rather. And the truth is is that if you are not behind the wheel and controlling a car, you are not the one navigating to get from one place to the other. The, the car is going to be doing all of that all of the time. And so what I find a bit alarming is just the idea that we won't have opportunities to do that. And, and for better or for worse, driving is one of the, the main day-to-day -day activities that most people have to navigate on their own these days. And so it's like, it's a fascinating question to me, you know, if, if driverless cars are the ones doing the navigating, what are the maps that they're using to get from place to place? Will they be choosing routes? And what's the basis for the routes that they will choose? And the whole idea of sort of forging our own paths of, you know, of taking the path less traveled, you know, all of these things that are sort of cliches, but are poignant to us because they represent something about human agency and our own autonomy and freedom would be changed and be influenced by that technology. So I, I'm definitely not on an anti-driverless car crusade, but I find the acceptance of the narrative that they will solve all of these problems and be inherently better for society and for us as individuals very suspect. And I wonder why it is that there's been so few criticisms and pushback against that narrative and just questioning of it from the media and, and, and from people. Although I think there's you know, a fair amount of skepticism out there in the public. <laughs>